Okay. The internet has changed so many things around us. The way we communicate, the way we relate to each other. Now, there are those that have seen an opportunity in this platform, a business opportunity, and they're taking advantage of this, running away with it, and making good money. But that's a story for later. This is Money and Markets, and I'm Charles Wood, your host. Today's businesses do not thrive on brick and mortar or having assets necessarily in tangible forms or terms. Take, for instance, Uber. It's a business built on enabling others who have these assets to make money, whether they own cars or motorcycles or border borders, the way we commonly refer to them. Today, we talked to the manager, the country lead of Uber in Uganda, to find out how this model has fared in this country. Right, Aaron, it's nice to have you on the show, Money and Markets. Thanks for having me. Now, give us an update. What's happening at Uber? Well, a lot is happening at Uber. A lot of exciting things are happening. So we've been in the market for the last two years. We launched in Uganda in 2016. And we launched the product UberX, which is the vehicles you find driving you around the city. Around this, uh, early this year, late March, we launched Uber Border, a motorcycle taxi, which, is now, which you can actually request now through the app and someone will come to your doorstep and take you to wherever you have to go to. So Uber has been quite exciting for us and we've seen it grow quite fast and we keep on looking at ways of making it improve and they, they make the population much more exciting mm -hmm. and safety remains the most critical thing I'm focusing on at the moment. Hey, you. Tell us more about the Uber Border product. So Uber Border is like a motorbike taxi, like I mentioned earlier on. Uber Border is like we've gotten drivers, we engage with respective drivers currently in the market, uh, train them about the technology that we have that can improve their efficiency. So for the driver, other than standing, sitting on a stage for two hours to wait for someone to come and take a trip, or maybe just driving all the way from Nigeria back to Kampala to your stage to get a passenger, that gamble goes away. You become more efficient using the technology. So we've had a lot of positive turnout from drivers coming up to sign up for the product mm -hmm. and it's been quite exciting. We also see Uber has also encouraged a new demographic of the population that has probably never used Uber before, could not use the Uber X product because it was slightly more pricey. So the low cost Uber border product, which is currently now at 50% discount compared to the market rates, is quite exciting to see the new people trying to experience the Uber experience for the first time. So okay. we've seen positive growth around that. Right. Tell us about the partnership that you have with um, an insurance player in this market. Why this partnership and why this partnership now? Yeah, I, I think if you look at the stats, like border is being uh, is being seen as like a very risky mode of transport. So at Uber, like what we focus on is we have a very serious commitment to safety, and part of our safety proposition is starts from the point at which we on border drivers. So we make sure like every driver coming onto Uber has all the compliance documents he needs. Critical among those is a driver's permit. So to show competence that he can actually drive, he has to be competent to drive. So we partnered with, partner with a few other companies like Uganda Driving Standards Agency, which trains drivers for competence and they actually end up going to get the driver's permits. But then also look further to see how can we encourage more people to use Uber. Maybe you've never used an Uber because you're scared of the accidents you've seen somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So we partnered with UAP or Mutual to package an insurance package that can be able to cover riders, riders being the passengers who are using Uber border mm -hmm. in the event of an accident, in the event of death, in the event of having to incur medical expenses. So if you request for an app through the Uber, Uber app and you get an Uber border and any of those catastrophes happen, we have you covered and we can cover different aspects around what could go wrong. Now, let's talk about opportunities. Uganda is a young country. What opportunities do you present to, you know, to a country like Uganda where you have a number of young people looking for what to do? Yeah, so I think the young population in this country, like, I think we've known that it's very high unemployment rate and we find that we can, people can have an opportunity to actually use our platform to earn extra money just to, make, to keep them going as they're looking for the next job they have. With Uber you have the flexibility to drive when you want to and, to, and not to drive when you feel like you have something else to do. So that flexibility is one thing that most people will be able to value quite a lot. Mm -hmm. We've seen so many drivers come onto the platform. Before Uber came into the market, you would never see of any female taxi drivers, probably. But right now we have females who are actually participating in public transportation using the app. We've seen women coming on the platform. We have about 25% women drivers mm -hmm. in Kampala, which is quite impressive. But then we've also seen other people, because our technology has been built to like, encourage, include so many other de demographics of people. We have people who are deaf, and can use our app 
to be able to tell that I have to go and pick up a trip. So we've seen deaf people coming onto the platform, we've seen people who have other disabilities come onto the platform, but because the technology is designed to make it easy for them to work in that atmosphere, we've seen more people come on. So we encourage all young people who are out there, you have a spare car in your compound, it's a way of making money. Mm. For the other person who has a good 9 to 5 job and you're looking for an extra way of making money, I think it's an open way for you to actually say I'll drive on the weekend, make an extra bit of money other than spending the money elsewhere. I think it's an open opportunity for everyone to come and join us. For the passengers, I think safety, like I mentioned, is very critical. I think most of the time we have a very active nightlife in Kampala, but it's always safe for you to make the right choice. Other than driving your car, just to hail a board, Uber car or Uber border, and that will take you back home safe. The trips are all recorded, so in case of safety incidents, we have a 24-hour support uh, service in the app itself. So you make sure you're always covered. We, record, we make sure every driver coming onto the platform goes through a background check yeah. and record every trip detail. So you're always going to be safe other than crashing a car in the event of after your party. That would be very sad. I hear you. Yeah. Let's talk business. Yes. Going back to the business aspect. Yeah. How is the growth trajectory like on the border side? So unfortunately, I cannot share with you precise numbers, but I will tell you it's been quite exciting. So right now we've seen, opt we launched in late March, so let me say early April right now. So since then we've seen the numbers grow. So compared to the scale we saw with the UberX product, it's grown almost 500 times faster. So it's quite huge because it's a very integral part of the city and most people might want to maneuver through the traffic much faster. So we're seeing it growing at a very fast rate. So we find it very exciting. I hear you. Thank, Thank you so very much. much. Very nice talking to you. Welcome. Pleasure indeed. There are many factors responsible for the collapse of most Ugandan businesses. Now, some of these factors are internal, while the others are external. We look at some of these factors and how they can be circumvented, overcome, to build successful business empires. Most businesses in Uganda start as sole proprietorships and many tend to come out as family businesses. Also true is that most of these Ugandan bread businesses tend to have a short lifespan, hardly making three years in operation. Even those that shoulder on will not survive after the demise of the proprietor. Part of the problem according to a PwC business owner study is lack of competitiveness, which is always catalyzed by informal operations. The ethical behavior of firms, and some of the firms say to us that it is actually a price for being compliant. Yeah? If you pay your taxes, if you uh, follow the uh, standards uh, for, 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 for doing business, your competition may actually not do that. So that puts you at a disadvantage and increases the costs uh, of you doing business. So when, we, when we speak to businesses, they would, they would mainly focus firstly on the external environment and it's only, it's only natural for us to always look externally. Uh, but when you actually look internally, you find that the family factor is the other element that actually impedes uh, competitiveness of family-owned businesses. The key issues here is that a number of proprietors do not prepare and structure families to run and take over such enterprises. But externally, the business environment in Uganda is viewed by some to be an independent in certain respects. One of the, uh, of the, of the, of the uh, elements that were identified as impeding competitiveness is the tax rate, a very high uh, tax rate. Uh, several taxes and a very high tax rate had to address that. Transparency in government policy making, another area of concern, a consultative approach, really encouraging the government to take a consultative approach in policy making. Uh, ineffective market demand, again, that is um, a reflection of the high unemployment rate, uh, which really impacts on the affordability um, of, of, of uh, goods and services. Another critical point of concern relates to the stringent conditions attached to financing local projects, especially the medium to large ones. Every bank, even PTA itself, said, I can give you money for real estate, but I cannot give you for sugar factory. I said, why? Because the area you are in Atiak is where the massacre happened. When I went, I said, now, this is the problem of Africa. I went and knocked, and they told me, you can only borrow money for that area at 36%. It's even worse when Ugandan bread businesses try to take the private equity direction, which is the other funding source. Now, an angel investor comes in, or a package, an MP comes in, they want approximately 20%. That's largely the, the hurdle rate in Uganda. They want to invest, most of them, minimum 5 or $10 million. Most of them are $10 million. That means in five years' time, they want to exit. 
Now, most businesses here, we build them because we want to pass on this business to your children or, you know, you have a longer term view. Most private equity funds want five years to eight years maximum they want to exit. So if they're getting a return of 20%, in five years they've put in $10 million, they want $20 million. It becomes a tall order how they exit. So they say either we're taking it to the market where you list, if you can list, then they make an exit, or we sell the business, because you sell the business, they'll cash in. But then you're out of the game because you couldn't buy their 20, pay the $20 million to them. So that's where the catch comes. And I warn many people that go in with your eyes wide open, get as much advice as possible. So how can family businesses or Uganda-owned businesses ride these tough waves with all these odds against them? Resilience. The other factors that people don't see that keep you going to make you really resilient and adaptable and able to be flexible, agility. Some of the things that are not probably emphasized enough in school when they are training and you get only when you are in an environment. And then our environment, like the Uganda environment, is, is very different from the environment in the United States or Europe and most of the countries where we send our kids to study. The other critical aspect is build good corporate governance structures that have been tested in the world of business, a company board, for instance. I think it uh, starts from the selection of the board itself. Uh, if you look at the Kakira board, it's a very, very strong board. The people who are there as a non-executive director, they have no fear, they have no hesitation, they have no uh, uh, way, they uh, listen only to the uh, managing director. They have their own uh, independent views, they uh, uh, take their own uh, decision. And I mentioned about this audit committee also, it's a, such a powerful audit committee. Doing businesses successfully has never been easy anywhere. The few who manage to succeed in the developed world have to adhere to particular principles. We'll now take a very short commercial break. Money and Markets continues.